Anderson and I'm the uh, portfolio manager for the Mercantile Investment Trust, which I'm going to talk about this evening. And uh, Mercantile uh, looks to invest in UK listed mid and small caps. Um, we, uh, sorry, I'm just trying to move the slide along. So what I thought I'd do would be to start off talking about um, what we see as the case for mid and small caps at the moment, where we see what we think of as a, as a pretty interesting opportunity. And then I'll talk about a few of the sort of mercantile specifics. And I'll, I'll try not to repeat um, too much of Laura's messages, because actually there's, there is a certain uh, amount of uh, similarity uh, in, in our views at the moment in terms of the opportunity that we can see. Um, but in terms of why do we think that mid and small caps are, are, are attractive, um, so on this slide here, we show the returns for a number of different um, equity markets going back uh, roughly 30 years now, so to the point at which Mercantile switched to being dedicated to UK listed mid and small caps in the middle of uh, 1994. And you can see here that um, the uh, UK market as a whole um, is the deep blue line, which is towards the bottom, but then the FTSE 250, which is the mid cap market, uh, is the yellow line, which you can see towards the top. So over this fairly extended time period, and it doesn't happen every year, but over uh, this period cumulatively, um, one can observe the significant outperformance of uh, the mid cap part of the market. So mid caps have returned 10% per annum over the last 30 years versus about 6% per annum. Uh, for the FTSE 100, so quite significant outperformance. And, and to our minds, this is really driven uh, by a number of factors. But before I go into that, um, one thing that we do observe when looking at that chart is it certainly looks like over the last three or four years, something, something has gone awry. So I think it's worth just zooming in on that period um, because the, the question, of course, is you know, because returns have, have not been so good over this period, is that because the earnings power of these businesses has, has structurally changed? Have these companies stopped growing um, or has something else been at play? And, and this, this sort of tallies with, with Laura's stats. But what we observe over the last four years, in fact, is this part of the market has derated. So it's gone from being valued at 15 times prospective earnings to around 11 times prospective earnings. So that equates to roughly a 7% per annum headwind um, to the stock market return, which has been roughly offset. Um, by earnings growth and uh, dividend yield. Now, in terms of taking the long-term view, why do we think this is an interesting part of the market? Really, it comes down to two things. The first of which is the superior growth that can be delivered by smaller companies relative to larger companies. And I don't think that's too contentious um, a statement um, that smaller companies have greater room to grow and are less limited by the underlying economic growth. And then the second point is on the greater level of incoming M&A, certainly a topic that, that Dan touched upon. Now, in terms of the superior growth, I think it's really interesting that smaller businesses can often be nimble and can adjust and uh, move with the times and develop the change. So for instance, WH Smiths, I think is a great example of that. It's a business which, you know, clearly if we look back and think about the business you know, 20 years ago, it was predominantly a high street business. We think about how they pivoted away from the high street into travel retail, which has far superior economics and far greater growth potential um, and has clearly delivered substantial earnings growth out over that time period. Then, of course, we have businesses that can innovate and, and take advantage of changes in the market. Rotor, one of our industrial holdings, a company that makes actuators, so, so the mechanism that controls essentially taps on valves. Um, is hugely benefiting from the uh, broader electrification trends um, that we can see across industries as they have a market leading position in that space, or simply businesses that operate in attractive and growing end markets. And Kemmering, I think, is a good example, another industrial company, one that serves um, the defense markets. And specifically within that, they have a business called Roke, which provides um, sort of high end consulting and, and technical services focused on. Uh, electronic warfare, so clearly a, a growth market. So we think these businesses can generate quite quite attractive growth over the long term. And then, of course, there is a greater um, probability that smaller companies will be acquired relative to large companies. And we show on this slide just some stats going back around 20 years, where you can see for each of the different bars, the percentage of each of uh, the UK indices that have been acquired per annum. And of course, it goes up and down in the cycle. 
but we can see on average around 2% of the FTSE 100 has been acquired per annum versus sort of 6 to 8% for mid and small caps. And if you just think mathematically, if we say on average the takeover premium is about 30%, if you just held the market, you would get that addition, that takeover premium of 30% on additional, call it four points to the index. So not immaterial when it comes to performance. And, and I know Dan talked about this, but clearly there's, there's quite a lot of activity coming into the UK market at the moment, um, which I think highlights some of the, the credentials, the valuation credentials. In addition, why do, why do we like our part of the market of mid and small caps? Well, there's clearly a greater breadth of opportunity. Um, the, the FTSE 100 is, is a very concentrated market, both of course by number of stocks, but also in terms of the sector exposure that comes with that. Whereas if we look below that part of the market, clearly there's a far broader range of companies. So we think lots of investment opportunities. And then similarly, as we move down through the cat spectrum, there are fewer investors and fewer researchers looking at these parts of the market. So, so we think that provides active managers with additional opportunities to outperform over time. So on average, I think it's 16 analysts from the sell side cover the FTSE 100 versus, versus nine or 10 for the, two, for the FTSE 250. So hopefully that gives a little bit of a flavor in terms of structurally why we think mid and small caps is an interesting part of the market. Um, in terms of the mercantile specifics, as, as I mentioned, we're looking to deliver uh, long-term capital growth by investing in a diversified portfolio of UK listed mid and small caps. But the focus, the bulk of the portfolio rather, is in the mid cap market. And just by diversified, we have a portfolio of roughly 70 holdings. So, so not as many as, 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 as Laura, um, but um, you know, a, decent, a decent number of holdings. And the investment process, I, I like to think it's a very disciplined investment process. Of course, it's based based on quite detailed fundamental analysis. We spend a lot of time uh, with, with my team, meeting management teams, really looking to, to get a really good knowledge of the businesses uh, in which we're investing. Um, some other quick sort of high, highlights of the strategy, I guess, in terms of the portfolio size, it's about um, between two and two and a half billion pounds, which is important for the end investors, just because there's good liquidity in the underlying mercantile shares. Um, and then of course, the benefits of scale come through um, with the ongoing charges. Um, now, in terms of in terms of the returns, they clearly have not been completely linear over time, but you can see um, just on this slide here, uh, the returns since since uh, I came on board, which was back in, in 2012. So it's annualized around a 10% return over, over that time period. And, and whilst long-term capital growth is absolutely our focus and how we invest, um, the board of the investment trust also have a goal, which is to grow the dividend at least in line with inflation. And we uh, have shown here just the, the data going back um, around 30 years. And over that time period, the dividend uh, has grown at about an eight and a half percent CAGA and indeed um, has never been cut. And this year we, we increased uh, the dividend by um, 7%, so pretty healthy, healthy growth. Now, in terms of what is it we look for in businesses? I'll cover this very quickly. We're just looking to invest in what we think of as structurally strong businesses. Um, so we spend a lot of time thinking about the quality of earnings, um, thinking about the sustainability of that, and crucially thinking about the capital discipline of the management teams. Are they investing capital and generating a strong return from that? And then of course we think about what is the outlook? And here I'm not talking about the next three months or six months talking about what do we think this business can deliver over the next three, four, five years, which tallies with our holding period of around five years on, on average. And, and then what is, you know, the third point, crucially, what is the price of this security? So are we buying this at an attractive entry point? Because of course, that is a crucial consi consideration. So maybe to bring this to life, I, I, I'll just cover one, one example, um, which is an investment we've got in a company called Cranswick. Um, which in its current iteration in the portfolio, we've held um, for roughly four years, although we, we, we did hold it um, a number of years earlier. Um, and this is, for anyone who's not familiar with this business, this is a pork processing business. So again, not something that necessarily jumps out as being hugely glamorous. Um, so they take in, um, well, the raw material of pork, i.e. pigs, um, and they process them and sell um, the pork 
to uh, a number of customers, including, of course, large supermarkets, um, QSR chains, etc. And inherently, that sounds like a pretty tough market where there are quite a few um, variables that are potentially outside of control of the company. And so, so my knee-jerk reaction would be to question why we think this is a good business. But actually, when, when we observe their financial results, and of course, when we meet with management, um, we can see that actually they have very close relationships with their customers, and that has allowed them to deliver very consistent uh, economic performance. So in other words, very consistent margin profile, and they have delivered an exceptionally uh, strong uh, growth uh, over an extended period of time. So growing at roughly 10% per annum, um, very consistently through the, the pork cycle as prices, of course, move up and down. And, and the most interesting thing about this business at the moment is um, the opportunity for them to continue gaining market share due to the weak uh, competitive landscape that they're facing. So many of their competitors, clearly we've We've been through a period in which uh, money was essentially free. So many of their competitors are quite highly levered. And of course, um, money is no longer free. So, that, so that's, that presents more of a challenge, which makes it potentially harder for some of their competitors to invest, whereas Cranswick are investing significantly in automation to look to generate a sustainable competitive advantage and thus drive um, ongoing market share gains, which, which is one of the types of growth, of course, that, that, that we really like. Um, so that's Cranswick, but what, what do we think about the market today and, and where are we seeing uh, the best opportunities? Um, so in terms of our, our top level view, of course, we're investing in UK listed businesses. That doesn't mean all of their exposure is in the UK, um, but for the mid cap part of the market and indeed the small cap part of the market, domestic economy um, is of far greater significance than for the FTSE 100, which of course is far more international. And when we look at the portfolio, roughly 50 to 55% of the revenue on a look-through basis is generated domestically. So I'll start off talking about the domestic outlook. And here I think actually things are looking pretty good. Um, so of course, as we know, we've been through a period of um, very significant inflation. And you can see on the left-hand side, uh, this chart, the blue line, just shows uh, UK inflation um, over, over the last few years and how it has moderated. And then, of course, what happened to um, base rates as the Bank of England took action uh, in a very dramatic fashion to try and try and um, bring that inflation back down under under control, even though, of course, much of it was was totally exogenous um, due to commodity prices. Um, so what we've seen is significant um, policy rate tightening. And, and in of itself, that, of course, should be negative for consumption. Um, but what we've seen, um, which has been really interesting, is, is the UK labour market has stayed um, strong through this period. And that has supported consumers when, of course, combined with the very uh, high levels of um, consumer sort of savings that had been um, made through the pandemic. Um, and so what we've seen, it's a slightly messy chart, but on the left hand, the left hand chart, the bit I would focus on is really the, the sort of or the orange bars, and they show the real average earnings growth um, over time. And so what we can see is, yes, the consumer came, the average consumer, um, that mythical average consumer, came under significant pressure over the last year and a half or, or two, two years. But actually, over the last, I think it's 10 months now, the consumer has been back into real wage growth and that's hugely important because if we look on the right hand side where we show that consumer confidence data we could almost overlay the real wage growth with the consumer confidence and consumer confidence as real wage growth has picked up consumer confidence has moved um, coincident with, with that and that's really important because essentially what these two charts show is that the average uk consumer has more money that they are able to spend Dis on a discretionary items today, and they have higher confidence, i.e. they have a greater propensity to spend. So they have more money and greater likelihood to spend. So that should lead to a pickup in consumption. Of course, we can't say exactly when that will happen, but that should lead to a pickup in consumption. And as we know, um, the, the consumption is the biggest driver of uh, the UK economy. When we look more internationally, one of the important sectors and for 
um, our portfolio certainly is uh, the broader industrial sector. And that again has been a sector um, that has been pretty weak in aggregate. It's dangerous to use aggregates, but in aggregate, um, since sort of you know early to mid 2022 for obvious obvious reasons and we show on these ch these chart here just a number of um, PMIs across different markets and the important line is if it's north of 50 it indicates expansion if it's below 50 it indicates contraction and what we can see is there is clearly signs of positive inflection here I think what's actually been really interesting within the industrial complex actually is, is how much uh, variation that has been across different specific end markets. So, for instance, you know, businesses that um, face into the aerospace industry haven't seen any downturn whatsoever, of course, because they've still been in recovery coming out of the pandemic, um, whereas those exposed, um, for example, to life sciences or, or certain semiconductors um, ha have, have seen dramatic weakness. So it is, of course, about what's going on underneath the surface. But in aggregate, I think the outlook here is improving. So, so that leads, leads us to have actually a pretty positive view about the opportunity for growth, certainly in our portfolio of companies, to accelerate. Um, and yet, when we look at valuations, um, you know, I think, I think the, the, the point that Laura made before about UK valuations in aggregate are currently at around a 40% discount versus the long-term average of around 15%. Um, and then when we look specifically within our part of market, the mid-cap market, um, it's trading roughly in line with the FTSE 100. So, so the, the blue line here shows the PE ratio for the FTSE 250, and then, then the yellow line shows the FTSE 100. So these markets are trading roughly in line with each other, um, which is at about a 15% discount for the FTSE 250 versus its long-run average. So essentially, there is the opportunity to buy mid-caps in the UK at a discount to large caps, which are themselves at a significant discount to their long run average. So I think a very compelling valuation opportunity. And that, 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 that really sort of summarizes my outlook. When we see the sort of net result of that in terms of our portfolio positions, and um, this just shows it at a sector level, but I think probably one of the interesting things within here is, for example, over the last 12 months, we have substantially increased our weighting in the house builders sector. So a sector that was under a you know, huge amount of pressure last year and, and, and last year, sort of from July um, towards the end of the year, um, we added around four percentage points in the portfolio to that part of the market where we could see really compelling valuation and quite clear evidence to our minds, at least, that we were at the nadir of the cycle with the opportunity for things to, to improve as we move through this year. And that's certainly something um, that we are we are beginning to see. Um, this is generally a quite a low turnover portfolio. So we turned over around 20% of the portfolio last year. So we are looking to make those long-term investment decisions, but of course, jumping on those, those really exciting opportunities as and when we see them. Um, so just, just to summarize, um, I would say from a from a top-down position, we, we're really excited about the long-term opportunity that uh, mid-caps present in terms of the superior growth and the superior returns potential. Um, we think that with a with a disciplined investment process, uh, Mercantile is is well placed to take advantage of that opportunity over the long term. And that when we look at the UK market today specifically, I think that moderating inflation and the resilience of the consumer certainly underpin our growing optimism for, for the outlook for an improving growth profile. And clearly the valuation, to our mind at least, does not reflect um, those compelling opportunities.